I'm Matt McClure and this is Currents. A look back at Iraq as military operations and a leading Catholic expert will offer his analysis of the last seven years. Plus, it's a new dawn in Iraq, Operation New Dawn. We'll look at what lies ahead. We're there, but we're watching and we're teaching, we're coaching, we're kind of prodding them on to the right decisions. And a Currents exclusive. A leading American cardinal offers his thoughts on how to rebuild that troubled country. Well, good evening. Thanks so much for joining us. Francesca Maxime has the night off. Well, early today, after more than seven years, a long and painful part of our history drew to a close, the war in Iraq. While an important phase of U.S. involvement there has ended, what has not ended is the debate. Was it worth it? What lessons have we learned and what lies ahead? Well, tonight we'll look for some answers and what some in the church are saying about the war. But we begin with the day's most dramatic news, the passage of power from one commander to another. We get details now from CNN's Samantha Hayes. In a ceremony in Baghdad, Defense Secretary Robert Gates and Vice President Joe Biden formally marked the transfer of command to the Iraqi government and the end of the U.S. combat mission in Iraq. With this change of command comes a change of responsibility. President Barack Obama announced the end of Operation Iraqi Freedom Tuesday night from the Oval Office. Ending this war is not only in Iraq's interest, it's in our own. The seven-year war claimed the lives of more than 4,400 U.S. troops. The president says while the combat mission has come to a close, about 50,000 U.S. troops will remain to help the Iraqi people. Advising and assisting Iraq security forces, supporting Iraqi troops in targeted counterterrorism missions, and protecting our civilians. Consistent with our agreement with the Iraqi government, all U.S. troops will leave by the end of next year. While President Obama says the end of combat operations in Iraq is the fulfillment of his campaign promise, Republican leaders pointed out that the president, as a senator, had opposed the troop surge generally credited with bringing stability to Iraq. The strategy of the surge was originated by President Bush and that President Obama opposed it and opposed it to the point where he, wanted to vo he voted to cut off all funds. In his speech Tuesday night, the president also emphasized domestic issues and said the economy is his top priority. That is CNN's Samantha Hayes reporting from Washington. Well, joining us now to put these events in context is an expert on the Catholic Church's so-called just war theory. He's Father John Langan, professor of philosophy at Georgetown University. Father, thank you so much for being here. It's a pleasure. Well, first of all, sir, just your reaction to the end of combat operations in Iraq. Well, I think it's a positive development. It's the end of something which was very painful for a lot of people. Um, and I think it is going to put to the test the whole question of whether Iraq will be able to sustain a peaceful and close to democratic regime. Mm. You know, as I said just a moment ago, you're, you're an expert on just war theory. Um, of course, that begs the question, was Iraq a just war? I really don't think that it was. Um, I, I think there was not really a clear just cause. And uh, I think the intelligence that was used to justify our entering the war was uh, faulty and was not interpreted in, in a responsible way. Mm. It was, uh, was a lot, of course, as we know now, they, we, we were told in the, in the beginning that Iraq had ties to al-Qaeda and that Iraq had uh, w or was right. trying to obtain weapons of mass destruction. Mm -hmm. And uh, that all, of course, turned out not to be true. What would be a just war? What, what kind of falls into the context of a just war if Iraq does not? Well, I think the, the war that we fought in Iraq uh, back in the early 90s uh, comes close to meeting the just war criteria that uh, there was a just cause there, Saddam Hussein's invasion of Kuwait, and uh, there was a high level of international cooperation and authorization, and uh, the, the whole thing was, uh, in fact, uh, presented to the American public in terms of just war categories by the first President Bush. Mm. 
Well, the, um, uh, I've heard other Catholics uh, said we had actually a guest on our show in the past from the Catholic peace group Pax Christi who said uh, that, you know, war doesn't ever really, uh, the, the ends don't ever really justify the means in war. In other words, that, that the uh, warfare doesn't create peace, it only creates more problems. But um, in some cases, you're, you're saying that, that the war is, ju that warfare is justified. Uh, what would your reaction be to someone who's on that side of the argument who would say that the ends never really justify the means when it comes to warfare and the use of violence? Uh, I think the bulk of historical experience tells, tells against that. Uh, the, the just war criteria are quite demanding, and I'm not saying that many wars actually fit perfectly within that framework, but it's a very good framework for us to use in thinking about these these hard issues, and it's not, a, I, I don't think uh, it's uh, fair just, or, or well argued, simply to say, well, the uh, the ends will not justify the means. We have to look at this on a on a case-to-case -case basis as honestly as we can. Mm. Well, what lessons have we learned from the war in Iraq, and uh, what can we learn from those experiences moving forward? Well, I think we, we clearly learned the limits of our own capabilities. Um, the fact that we could establish air dominance and even land dominance uh, did not mean that we could really control the country. Uh, we had uh, a lot of learning to do. Uh, we had to find allies within the country our knowledge of the country before we started was very inadequate. Uh, so uh, I think we've had lessons in humility uh, that bear on both the way we fight and the way we interpret intelligence. All right. Um, well, Father John Langan, that is all the time that we have here today. But Father John Langan, professor of philosophy at Georgetown University, thank you so much for your time. We really appreciate your insight. Very good. Thank you. Thank Bye you. now. And we have much more ahead on this historic change in Iraq. But coming up next, we'll have the rest of the day's headlines, including a New Yorker who fell 40 stories and lived. And wait till you hear of what it may have saved his life. We have that and more when we come back. Welcome back to Currents, I'm Matt McClure. Coming up in just a bit, the war in Iraq may be over, but one Catholic leader says humanitarian efforts need to be ramped up. But first, let's turn to the day's headlines. Well, the World Council of Churches is condemning the killing of four Israeli settlers in the West Bank this week. The terrorist group Hamas claimed responsibility for the shooting deaths, which happened near the city of Hebron. In a statement, the WCC says the extremists who encourage and legitimize violence must not be allowed to succeed. Amid this new violence, the president of Israel will meet with Pope Benedict on Thursday. We get details on that meeting now from Rome Reports. Shimon Perez is scheduled to meet with Pope Benedict on Thursday in Castel Gandolfo. Despite the cordial formalities of the meeting, Israel continues to postpone full implementation of its framework agreement with the Vatican, signed in 1993. This accord is known as the Fundamental Agreement, calling for an exchange of ambassadors and a series of measures to gradually normalize diplomatic relations. Discussions have been ongoing, although without a resolution. Despite the difficulties, in 1997 the juridical personality of the Church was recognized, although none of the previous agreements were incorporated into Israeli legislation. Current discussions are focusing on fiscal matters regarding the Catholic Church, the restitution and protection of church property, and especially the safeguarding of the holy sites. This agreement aims to ensure that the church in Israel can continue its mission and have tax exemptions since it cannot sustain the financial burden. The church in the Holy Land has no economic resources and is supported by charitable giving from Christians around the world. The papal nuncio Archbishop Antonio Franco is one of the main partners in the talks between Israel and the Vatican. He's optimistic about the future outcome of the dialogue. The next bilateral meeting between the Vatican and Israel will be on December 6th. Israeli sources say that an agreement could be worked out by the end of the year. Israel is favorable to the presence of the church there since the Christian presence helps relations between Muslims and Jews, a process which also helps efforts for peace, justice and harmony. Shimon Peres has met on three other occasions with Benedict XVI. The last time was in 2009 when the Pope visited the Holy Land. Although the President of Israel has only symbolic power, 
His meeting with the Pope is likely to favor the negotiation process between the two states for implementation of the accord signed 17 years ago. Well, meantime, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu and Palestinian President Mahmoud Abbas will be in Washington tomorrow to meet with President Obama. The leaders will try to restart the long-stalled Mideast peace talks. 28 Christian leaders, including the head of the U.S. Bishops' Conference, sent a letter to President Obama this week urging him to continue the work of, quote, achieving a just, lasting, and comprehensive peace with a viable Palestinian state living side-by-side -side with Israel in peace and security. Now, the peace negotiations will be the first in more than 20 months. Well, Catholic bishops in Germany issued new rules Tuesday on how to deal with cases of sexual abuse by clergy. The new rules require any case of suspected child abuse to be reported to police. And that rule applies, as I said, to any case and not just when the victim comes forward. The guidelines also say that all employees who work with young people must undergo a police background check and possibly a psychiatric evaluation. German church officials say they will review those standards in three years. As wrangling continues over the proposed Islamic Center near Ground Zero, police in western New York State have filed charges against a group of teenagers for yelling obscenities during evening prayer and firing a shotgun outside a mosque. Police say no one was hurt in that shooting, which happened last Friday. Reports say the teens shouted obscenities and sideswiped a worshiper with a car on Monday. It all happened outside the World Sufi Foundation in Carlton, New York. In the meantime, the Federal Equal Employment Opportunity Commission filed a lawsuit this week against a Nebraska company for allegedly not allowing Muslim employees time to pray. The suit accuses JBS Swift and company officials of violating the workers' civil rights by failing to make reasonable religious accommodations. The workers say they faced harassment and possible termination for asking to pray. Well, in Oklahoma City, a completely different kind of religious group is trying to recruit followers these days. A satanic church has scheduled a big event at the city's Civic Center. Jennifer Pierce reports. The Civic Center that has held musicals, ballets, and weddings is now opening its doors to Satanists. They call themselves the Church of the Four Majesties. They're planning an October 21st event. The website claims it will include a satanic ritual. Satan will be coming out of hell with his giblets attached. The church's head minister, who wouldn't reveal his real name or face, says the ritual is a staged exorcism, nothing more than a parody of the Catholic Church but says his now, church said is no laughing matter. We are legit, we are filed at the state capitol, yes ma'am. The church has filed for corporation status and at least one of its members has minister credentials. Now the church is after followers. The purpose of the satanic event is to spread a message. Our job is to provide a community and a basis where everybody can meet and practice their belief peacefully. And the city can't keep them from gathering at the Civic Center. We are a government entity and as such we have to abide by the laws of the Constitution of the United States. In saying that, we have to abide by the First Amendment, which allows freedom of assembly for all groups. That report from Jennifer Pierce in Oklahoma City. And finally, a Manhattan man dove off the top of an Upper West Side building Tuesday, fell 40 stories, landed on a car, and lived. And the car's owner says heavenly intervention is to thank for his survival. Reports say 22-year-old Thomas McGill apparently jumped from the building on West 63rd Street, crashed through the windshield of a car, and landed in the back seat. Police say McGill suffered broken legs and was in critical condition at last check. Now, the owner of the car that he fell into credits the rosary beads he kept in the car with saving the man's life. Stay tuned. There's much more Currents coming up. When we come back, learning from the past for Iraq's future. Today is a new dawn in our relationship with the government of Iraq. Welcome back to this special edition of Currents as we look at the war in Iraq. Well, as the U.S. mission there changes from combat to support, a lot of people are asking what happens next. The daily lives of troops left on the ground will certainly change as they take a back seat to Iraqi leadership. But what about when those troops come back home too? What happens then? 
Those are difficult questions to answer, especially for many people of faith who thought the war should never have been fought in the first place. Just ahead of the U.S.-led invasion of Iraq, Pope John Paul II sent a diplomat to the United States. His name was Cardinal Pio Laghi. He had previously served as the first ever papal nuncio to the U.S. In 2003, John Paul gave Laghi what would end up being his last diplomatic assignment to deliver a personal message to President George W. Bush to put a stop to the Iraq invasion. Cardinal Laghi delivered the message, but he said it fell on deaf ears. I should have maybe knelt down or do something in order to say, Mr. President, please, Mr. President, please. I did that, but maybe I wasn't so forceful enough. Laghi said he told the president at the time that with peace, nothing is lost, but war only brings greater turmoil. Two months after the invasion, President Bush declared mission accomplished during a now infamous speech from the deck of the aircraft carrier USS Abraham Lincoln. My fellow Americans, major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. But American troops had only just begun their combat operations in Iraq. Fast forward seven and a half years, and more than 4,000 U.S. troops died in the war, another 34,000 injured. Only now has Operation Iraqi Freedom really come to an end. Today is a new dawn in our relationship with the government of Iraq. We can no longer dwell on our past accomplishments, but must remain focused on the tremendous opportunity at hand. 50,000 U.S. troops are still in Iraq to begin Operation New Dawn. But what does that mean for those men and women in uniform? Well, first and foremost, it means their jobs have changed from being combat soldiers to playing an advise and assist role with Iraqi troops taking the lead. We're there, but we're watching and we're teaching, we're coaching, and we're kind of prodding them on to the right decisions. New Dawn also means more work for some American flight crews, especially those flying Black Hawk helicopters. And we're the only, one of the only support aircraft here since we had Chinooks that were here, they just recently left. So it's picked up quite a bit for us. But the larger question, where does Iraq go from here, remains to be answered. Some critics fear that the war that just ended will end up leaving Iraq a less stable and more dangerous place than before. A few months ago, I spoke with Jim Kelly of the Catholic peace group Pax Christi. Speaking in broad terms, he said wars only create new problems. Because the underlying conflicts haven't been really resolved. Right. So what Pope John II did there, John, uh, was uh, John Paul II, was commit the church to its origins, to become a church of nonviolence. Right. And, and Catholics uh, don't realize that. Yeah. But if all goes according to plan, all U.S. troops will leave Iraq by the end of 2011. That's a pledge President Obama reiterated Tuesday night. However, some Catholic leaders, including Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, say that does not mean the U.S. has no more responsibility there, and that the basic human needs of Iraqis will still need to be met. And when we come back, I'll bring you my conversation with the Archbishop Emeritus of Washington, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. We'll hear his thoughts on what needs to happen in Iraq down the road. Well, finally tonight, as the United States turns a new page in Iraq, one leading cardinal has offered his own proposal for how to help that embattled country. Last month, in an exclusive interview with Currents, retired Washington Archbishop Cardinal Theodore McCarrick said that he believes the United States is not doing enough to help Iraq's refugees. On the website Politics Daily, he wrote that the U.S. needs to work with the Iraqi government as well as the international community to come up with a plan to help Iraq's displaced people. Cardinal McCarrick compared it to the Marshall Plan, which helped rebuild Europe following World War II. Well, here again is my conversation with him. Cardinal McCarrick, thank you so much for joining us here on Currents today. We really appreciate you taking some time out to join us, sir. No, I'm, I'm happy to do it, and what we're discussing is very important. 
Well, yes, it is. As a matter of fact, you know, uh, as, as I'm sure you're, you're very aware, President Obama has uh, uh, made a speech here just very recently uh, talking about the drawdown of troops from Iraq. And you wrote an article recently uh, for Politics Daily in which you said that the end of our military presence there should not be the end of our dealings with Iraq and that there is a mission still to be done. Tell me a little bit about what was in that article. Well, basically, as we as we know, the president has established his timetable. We will be uh, drawing down our uh, our troops there. Most of them are going to be just in training uh, Iraqi uh, police and soldiers. But my my fear is that you know when uh, out of sight, out of mind, and we may forget that the, because of because of the war there, we have left a situation in Iraq which is which is very very difficult for the people. Uh, there are there are more than a million refugees outside of Iraq, and probably an equal number within Iraq. Uh, the displaced people uh, away from their homes, trying to to make do, trying to find jobs, trying to find enough to keep their families going, trying to find food and and protection and everything. And 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 outside of Iraq, there are these people who may or may not try to go back. I think most of them will not come back. Yeah. And so what it, I think we are, we can't walk away from that because whether it was the, the right thing to do or not is not the question. We, we may, and please God, we will be able to stop our military involvement, but we can't stop the humanitarian involvement. Right, there's st still a great need there. And, and which begs the question, who should be responsible for providing that humanitarian aid? Should it be the U.S. military or should it be some other entity? Well, that uh, that's really a question for the politicians, and, and not <laughs> and not for bishops who are who are concerned about about people. Uh, all all we can do is say, you don't forget this. This is something you've got to do. You, you've got to take care of your neighbor. Your right. neighbor is not just the family that lives across the street. Your family is the fam. Your neighbor is the family that lives across the world. There you go. Absolutely. And, well, and and in that speech that President Obama gave, that I had sort of started out this uh, this interview here by talking about. Uh, the president said, we'll maintain a transitional force until we remove all of our troops from Iraq by the end of next year. Uh, forces will have a focus mission supporting and training Iraqi forces, doing counterterrorism, that sort of thing. So that mission is really different from what you're, you're talking about here. Some people might say, well, we're still going to be there, but they won't really be doing a lot of the humanitarian things as so much as they will uh, be uh, training and trying to stabilize uh, the Iraqi military force. Hey, hey, exactly, Matt. And, and the, the real key to it is uh, many of these Iraqis are not in Iraq. That there, there's more than a million, maybe a million and a half of them in, in, in different places. And the majority of them in Syria, a great number of them, maybe half a million in, in Jordan, and, uh, and a, a smaller number, but still a substantial number, in Lebanon. And you know, so that we, our withdrawal from Iraq is one thing, and our taking care of the displaced people in Iraq is another very important thing. But the third thing is the Iraqis who have left that country because of the war, because of the invasion, because of the problems, and, and because the, the situation, the social situation in that land has been changed so much, a lot of people are afraid to go back. What can the church do to help make the situation in Iraq better going down the road? Well, the church is suffering there. But many of its people are gone. Uh, there is a, a, a revived uh, discrimination against Christians, maybe even in some areas persecution, and, and that's uh, that's something that that our church is going to have to live with. Now, I think that it's it's up to the, our country and, and others to try to make sure that the Iraqi Constitution, which does now call for freedom of religion, is going to be is going to be observed. And if there is persecution of anyone. And uh, I think of the Catholics or Jews or, or Baha'i or someone like that, then you know, we, the, the world has to say, hey, you can't do that. We know that we've, we've screwed up your economy, but you still, have to say, you still can't treat people without human dignity. All right. Well, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick, thank you so much, sir, for joining us here on Currents today. We really appreciate your time. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. God bless you. Thanks. And of course, the Archbishop Emeritus of Washington, Cardinal Theodore McCarrick. Well, that's it for tonight. Now, coming up tomorrow, what did Bishop DiMarzio do before he became a priest? Well, the bishop has some surprising and revealing answers when he talks to us about work 
and Labor Day. That and more tomorrow. But in the meantime, remember, we're always online over at CurrentsNY.net. You can also check us out on Facebook. Until next time, I'm Matt McClure. Thanks for joining us and have a great night.